Hello, everyone. Welcome to Beacon Point Summer Educational Series Foundations of Finance, the Basics of Investing in Financial Planning. Today is our third class of the series, continuing our learning of economic basics, including stocks, bonds, and alternative investments. My name is McKenna Kerr, and I'm a marketing associate for Beacon Point and have the pleasure of introducing you to our professors for today's class session, Dylan McDonald and Matt Henn. They were both born and raised in Southern California and are based out of our Beacon Point Newport Beach office. Dylan and Matt are both certified financial planners and Matt also holds the Retirement Income Certified Professional designation. Additionally, Dylan is an adjunct professor at UC Irvine teaching the Wealth Management MBA course at the Paul Mirage School of Business. Both Dylan and Matt have helped many clients in their multi-generational families build their comprehensive financial plans. Before we dive into today's class, I wanted to quickly review a couple of housekeeping items. Should you have any questions that arise throughout the presentation, you can send them to info at beaconpoint.com with the subject line, Foundations of Finance, Class 3, questions, and we will follow up to get those answered accordingly. That wraps up all of the class prep information. So Dylan and Matt, why don't you get us started? Hi, everyone. And first and foremost, thank you all for, for your time. And thank you, McKenna, for the wonderful introduction. As mentioned, my name is Dylan McDonald, and it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by my colleague and good friend, Matt Henn. I uh, always look forward to these sessions over the summer uh, to collaborate with a guy like Matt, someone who I really respect in the industry. So we always have a lot of fun uh, getting to know you all and talking a little bit about finance. So that being said, wanted to lay out what our key agenda items will look like for today, just so we understand what we're going to uh, try to accomplish. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to review a bit around users of, of capital, capital meaning, you know, investments, cash or otherwise that can be used to finance different activities, right? And, and users can really run the gamut between individuals like all of us on this on this call here today. Uh, government, municipalities, and large corporations. Think about the Apples, the Google, Googles, the Microsofts of the world, et cetera. So we'll get a little bit more into detail there. On the flip side, there's providers of capital, those who provide capital to finance cash flow generating activities for these different individuals, government, municipalities, or companies. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of how to provide and how to use capital. Asset allocation, this is kind of a nice segue into how we then look at uh, designing portfolios, right? So there's a strategic mix of stocks to bonds to cash to what we call alternative investments and how those all come together and end up working to create a nice strategically built portfolio should be customized according to the clients that we work with overall uh, risk profile and equally, if not more importantly, their uh, long-term financial goals. So we'll talk about how we start to strategize that. Um, the role of alternatives. So um, at this point, uh, Matt will look to kind of get into how alternative investments can provide a nice little complement to the more traditional stocks and bonds across a portfolio. And essentially, in some cases, look to zig when the market will zag. Um, there's something called non-correlation that we look for with these alternative investments, whereby if stocks and bonds may be going through a bit of volatility, we'll look for alternatives to help kind of serve as a bit of a ballast and complement what we're doing there. Um, we would like to no acknowledge a brief note on risk tolerance, how we weigh it as one key data point that's going to influence the portfolios that we'll build for our clients uh, and those that we work with. Um, and then we'll uh, provide a nod to what's to come uh, in the near term as far as these presentations and education sessions are concerned. Um, I would like to note, too, again, credit to all of you for spending time over your summer months getting educated on these things where it starts with finances, understanding uh, what's out there and available, and education extreme, is extremely powerful, and we at Beacon Point take that very seriously. So credit to you all for send, spending some time over the summer. With that, we'll transition into who can be deemed a user of capital. And I alluded to this on the previous slide, but it can really run the gamut between uh, individuals like all of us here, families, uh, governments, uh, and then large corporations out there as well. And I think when I think about individuals who could potentially use capital influxes into their into their life, I think one of the more one of the more timely examples here is. You know, students, uh, undergraduates, graduate students who could use capital to effectively uh, finance their their education, right? We all know that um, 
uh, college is, is, is not cheap, and we need to make sure that there are plans for financing uh, the costs of education going forward. Students have a very important decision to make when it comes to how they are to uh, ultimately finance the, the expensive costs of college that uh, they could be facing. In some cases, you know, student loans might be a, a key place to lean on. Uh, but of course, you have to make sure that you're prepared to repay those loans down the road. And of course, interest rates are going to have a big impact on that decision. Um, you know, cash or savings, leaning on an asset is another way that students, if they're fortunate enough, could lean on or another method they could lean on to help, uh, you know, to uh, to set them up, themselves up for future education costs as well. Um, you think about corporate America, you know, companies face a ton of decisions every single day around how to invest in themselves or look for capital to be invested into their respective balance sheets uh, to begin to finance their cash flow generating activities, right? You think about these uh, corporations that may need to finance the build out of a warehouse, uh, you know, you think about Apple perhaps building a warehouse to be able to produce more more iPhones, one of their key revenue drivers. And, you know, sometimes that that's going to mean, you know, going to investors to ask for capital that they can use to influx into the business. It could be it could mean issuing debt to uh, that they may eventually have to repay. But you start to really see how there are options out there and how different um, entities would need to make some considerations to invest in their future now so that, you know, down the road, uh, they're much better off. Governments, think about, you know, things happen all the time. I mean, we have roads, uh, different infrastructure, bridges, et cetera, that's going to need rebuilding uh, and upgrades over time. And at that point, government, local municipalities, state municipalities are going to have unique decisions to make to whether they should perhaps issue bonds, seek out investors. Uh, a recent example is, uh, I believe it was the uh, the Buffalo Bills, if I'm not mistaken, who recently, uh, you know, their their <laughs> stadium that was built out was, was financed with a lot of uh, local municipal uh, government bonds. So again, those are the type of projects that could come up and there are strategic decisions that need to be made, uh, you know, both now and in the future as well. There are different costs that will uh, that these users of capital are going to have to weigh the pros and cons of to help determine which path they're going to take. Some of it has to do with the size of, for example, just using companies as the particular user example here. Um, the size of the business is going to have a big uh, is going to dictate perhaps the route that these uh, that that they end up going. Uh, for example, small companies may not have as much um, uh, decision-making power in terms of what they'll use to finance their projects. Um, as smaller companies may not have the opportunity to take on debt, for example, because their cash flow isn't yet up to a point where they're entirely comfortable repaying these loans down the road. Therefore, what would they have to do? Likely have to issue some equity in the business, um, you know, to help to, you know, uh, receive an influx of capital and then get themselves off and running. Yeah. And, and if, 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 well, one thing I was going to mention, Dylan, if, if you think about it this way as well, I mean, if you're, if you are an investor and you're looking at a small company, uh, let's say it's only a couple of people who are running it. Granted, of course, there's, there's risk there. Right. And so sure. if you are going to uh, uh, provide uh, capital, then um, you likely will be, they will likely be giving up equity in their company so that you, there's unlimited upside rather than issuing debt where it has limited upside and a significant amount of downside as well. So uh, from an, uh, companies who are looking to raise capital to fund their projects and ultimately uh, growth objectives, they're uh, considering, well, from a cost perspective, what is most costly for us as a company, but then also is what is accessible to us. Um, so those are two key uh, things to think about when, when corporations and users of capital are looking to raise capital to fund their projects. Great points. And and that that's a great segue into what larger companies may have a bit more uh, liberty in choosing, you know, what they'll what they'll use and how they will take on capital, right? How they will use capital. Um, you know, they may be in a position to where, you know, they can issue more debt, right? Their uh, larger companies may be in a cash flow situation where they're comfortable taking on debt and repaying uh, the loans that they took out over time because their, you know, cash flow generate, generating activities are already up and running. 
On the other side, you know, we certainly have providers, providers of capital to consider. And this is where Matt and I usually like to take a step back as well uh, and remind everyone of, kind of what we call the risk spectrum, right? So, you know, to really, to put it very, very simply, um, you know, if you think about the trade-off between stocks and bonds or equity and debt, if you will, um, if you're to buy equity or shares in a company, um, you're effectively participating in the um, uh, in the returns uh, of that company and ultimately the profit and how that company is doing over time. As a result, the risk may be a little bit higher, but the long-term expected return as a trade-off would be expected to be higher as well. Um, to that end, debt has a uh, uh, sits on the other side of the risk spectrum, perhaps a little bit more conservative, if you will, whereby a, a bond is an agreement whereby a municip you you promise to lend a municipality or a corporation a certain um, uh, chunk of funds, and the agreement is for them to repay you back at the end of that bond term the full amount that was lent. In exchange for lending those funds, you're paid a nice interest rate along the term of that bond. So if there is effectively, and we can never use the word guarantee, but if there is the expectation that at the end of that bond term, you as the uh, provider of capital are to be repaid back at the end of the bond term, um, you know, the, the return over that time period may not be expected to be as high. So again, less risk, therefore lower expected total return over that time frame. Anything to add there, Matt? Yeah, and then just the other thing that I was going to add to that uh, as well is, I mean, if you think about if you're going to be uh, uh, issue a bond or a company is going to issue a bond uh, to a, uh, a lender, so an investor, um, if, the, if that company ever goes out of, out of business, well, if they have to liquidate their assets to be able to reap, they first have to repay their uh, their bondholders first. Right. So there's an ordering process in the event that that company is not able to uh, continue to stay in operation. And so that's another key, uh, you know, basic with respect to why bonds are generally uh, less riskier than equities, because in the event that that company is not able to uh, continue to in existence, well, they first owe their their bondholders repayment of those bonds to the extent that they have the ability to to uh, repay first before they uh, provide any type of uh, proceeds to their equity holders. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's an added layer of security, right, Matt, when it yeah. comes to, you know, choosing whether I buy stock or whether I, you know, um, uh, buy bonds across the investment platform. McKenna, yes. looks like we have a question. Yeah, would you mind clarifying the difference between municipal bonds and company issued bonds and if there's a potential for tax reduction? Great question. Yeah, so there certainly are ta uh, differences on the tax treatment of buying a municipal bond versus a corporate bond. If you're to buy a municipal bond within the state or local municipality where you live, um, the income on that bond is uh, tax free on the federal side. So there are certainly uh, benefits to, again, in certain cases, and everyone's portfolio is going to look a little bit different. Um, but in many cases, it does make sense to, after you count for taxes, uh, municipal bonds can make uh, a lot of sense. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else there, Matt? Yeah, I was just going to mention with respect to, you know, municipal bonds are uh, especially attractive for individuals and families who are in higher uh, tax brackets because, as an, from an advisory perspective, uh, what you look at with a municipal bond is, you know, the coupon payment or the income that it produces could be less, but you also have to factor in the tax equivalent yield, right? Which means that if I were to go out and buy a corporate bond, what kind of return would I have experienced or what kind of income would I have experienced? And the way that investors should really be looking at it is uh, how much am I able to keep in my pocket after all taxes are paid? Uh, and so for for those uh, investors who are in the higher income tax bracket, off, oftentimes that means uh, municipal bonds. If you're in the lower end of the tax brackets, it actually might be less advantageous to buy municipal bonds. And perhaps that's when you consider buying taxable bonds or corporate bonds. 
Well said. And and the idea there, right, Matt, is the higher the tax bracket that that I'm in, the greater the potential tax break with muni yes. bonds. Is that right? Yes. The more attractive the ultimately return is the yield is on that municipal bond. Net after tax. So that that's you know an important point that Matt brings up. That tax equivalent yield figure is something that we pay very close attention to here. Um, so again, this entire conversation around uh, you know users of capital and providers of capital, it, it all funnels down to when we are designing portfolios for, for clients and ultimately customizing the mix of these equities or stocks, uh, the combination with bonds, some cash, alternative investments, et cetera, what, what makes sense and, and why, right? And again, on that risk spectrum, if you think about greater expected return with equities, which, which comes with greater risk. Um, but with bonds, as Matt uh, eloquently pointed out that, you know, there is some sense of security to be repaid at the end of the, the loan term. You know, the, normally it makes sense to have a little bit of stocks and bonds across a client portfolio, but that mix is really going to be dictated by what are your financial goals, right? And it's not just as simple as, well, you know, I'm um, near retirement age and, you know, I, I'm looking at starting to withdraw from the portfolio. It's more specifically, what is your appetite for risk? And are you able and willing to withstand the market volatility that, you know, we could experience in the not so distant future? In addition to, do you have goals of leaving assets to, to heirs as well, right? Do you have folks that do you have specific income needs from the portfolio? All of these inputs will get factored into a larger financial plan and combine with what I alluded to earlier, a risk tolerance survey, um, what the market landscape looks like at this point in time, uh, along with the financial plan. And we come up with a real customized allocation that will include stocks, bonds, some alternative investments, and in some cases, maybe some cash, dry powder, if you will, that could be deployed if the market pulls back or equally, if not more important, sent to uh, uh, clients' bank accounts to to cover their expenses. So um, it's a lot more calculated than, you know, just uh, a 50% uh, equity and a 50% bond portfolio. We'll, we'll tend kind of weigh the pros and cons of each. Anything I missed there, Matt? No, I think you got it. That being said, you know, again, we've already touched on again in, in light of from the perspective of users and providers of capital, we've looked at the difference between stocks, stocks and bonds or equities and debt. Uh, Matt's going to begin to touch on the role that something new could play uh, alternative investments uh, and what that looks like within client portfolios and perhaps uh, a little bit around asset allocation here in uh, a second. Uh, so with that being said, I, I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, to Matt here to talk a little bit about asset allocation. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Uh, yeah, so asset allocation, let's talk about what it is first. Uh, asset allocation is essentially what asset classes are we holding in the portfolio and at what proportion are we holding them? And the reason why asset allocation is so important is because if you uh, look at empirical research, it shows that over 90% of long-term portfolio outcomes is driven by this asset allocation decision. So from an investor perspective, from an advisor perspective, we look at uh, asset allocation incredibly, in, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, we're very, very focused on asset allocation. Um, you know, uh, that being said, one of the reasons why we focus on asset allocation is because what we are trying to do, particularly from an institutional investment framework, is trying to seek the greatest level of return with the least amount of risk possible. And, and we achieve this through asset allocation. Let me share with you kind of uh, an idea and a thought that I think uh, can help uh, make sense of this. So let's go back to the great financial crisis of 2008. It was a really difficult time for investors, but particularly equity investors, stock investors. Uh, during that time period, when uh, markets were pulling back significantly, um, you know, a 100% equity portfolio at the time, a very diversified equity portfolio of U.S. stocks, but also international stocks, once it finally hit the very bottom, it took almost four full years or 46 months for that portfolio to fully recover um, from the very bottom of the stock market. However, 
if you were to add an allocation to bonds, just 30%, so you took your 100% stock portfolio and you made it a 70-30 portfolio, so 70% stocks, 30% bonds, it would have taken 16 months for that portfolio to fully recover. So two and a half times, uh, two and a half uh, years less than, uh, or two and a half times less, excuse me, than the 100% stock portfolio. Uh, and the reason why this is so important is because when you, when we are building out portfolios, we have to really understand the goal and the objective of uh, this particular, perhaps account, the, the goal and objective of these particular dollars, and then um, and then build it at, that into their financial plan. So for instance, uh, let's say you have a retirement, let's say you're in your, your 20s, 30s, or even 40s, and you still have maybe a 10 to 20 to a 30 year time horizon until you actually get to retirement. You know, arguably one could say, well, you should, you have the capacity for risk. And so therefore maybe it does make sense to have hundred percent allocation to equities in that particular portfolio or what we, what we could consider hundred percent allocation to a growth asset or assets that have a greater level of risk. And the reason why that is, is because you have time, you have the, you have the time, uh, in order to make up for any significant losses, because ultimately that 100% growth portfolio is going to provide you the greatest level of return over the great uh, over that time frame. However, for those clients who are perhaps going to be accessing uh, capital uh, in a shorter period of time, perhaps maybe five, 10, 15 years, it does actually might make sense to have an allocation to more conservative assets or stable assets whether that be bonds or also uh, alternative investments that help reduce risk and ultimately uh, smooth out the experience of what can be a pretty volatile market. Any thoughts on that, Dylan? Yeah, no, it's a perfect summary. I, I think you can attest to the idea that we we take it a layer deeper in looking at not just uh, you know time horizon for when individuals or families need to access their own capital from their portfolios, but their comfort level and their their willingness to to be exposed to equities versus bonds, et cetera. Because, you know, again, if we can remove unnecessary risk from their situation, it allows all of us to stay the course during those times of market volatility, right? Where there's a bit of uncertainty. And we all know that the best thing we can do during market volatility is to avoid the temptation to try to panic and go to cash, right? It's to really stay yes. the course as yes. long as you have a good game plan in place. Yes. Very good. All right. I think we're ready for the next slide. You touched on this already, Matt, in terms of the, um, the really the drivers of portfolio performance and how important it is to get the asset allocation correct. Yeah. Uh, really, it's just a you know small proportion of the actual selection of the investments that plays the role. Well, and yeah, let's just pause for a second, because I think that um, I think it's worth maybe bel belaboring the point here. Um, you know, when you think of uh, the long term drivers of portfolio outcomes, there's really three of them. Of course, we touched on asset allocation being the biggest driver of portfolio outcomes. Uh, in this particular little pyramid, it, it suggests that over 90%, I've actually seen studies that maybe it's even over 93% of asset allocation is the biggest driver of portfolio outcomes. But there's two other drivers as well, which is security selection, as well as market timing. And, and ultimately, uh, and we'll, we'll, let's talk about those. So what security selection is, is what actual uh, individual securities or managers am I holding in my portfolio? Um, that's security selection. The other ones is uh, is market timing. So when do I get into the market and when do I get out of the market? And ultimately, when do I get back in? It's really three decisions when you're choosing to do market timing. And, and more often than not, uh, market timing detracts from portfolio outcomes. Um, and so, you know, once again, this is really why asset allocation has become so important is because uh, the biggest contributor to portfolio outcomes is asset allocation. Um, well put. So let's also talk about what we call alternative investments. And so what, what an alternative investment is, is really 
a, an investment that does not fit nicely under uh, a, a traditional stock allocation or a traditional bond allocation. Uh, it kind of falls out of those two uh, categories. And so really um, the, the true definition of an alternative is anything that does not uh, fit into those categories um, um, properly. Um, and so what an alternative investment can be, it could be commodities, precious, otherwise known as precious, precious metals. Um, it could be real estate. You can think of hedge funds, private equity, private debt, otherwise known as uh, private credit. And so when you have these types of alternative investments within a portfolio, the idea here is we can first and foremost, the biggest priority is, are we able to reduce risk? And oftentimes you are. And, and one of the reasons why that is, frankly, is just due to diversification. You have more assets in the portfolio that are growing over the course of time, and they're going to be zigging while other investments in the portfolio are zagging. The idea is that they're not 100% correlated traditional stocks and bonds. And for that reason, it helps reduce risk. So that's really the, the biggest reasons why uh, we will seek to add uh, maybe al an alternative allocation to the portfolio. But the other kind of cherry on top is oftentimes with alternative allocations, you're able to seek higher levels of return over greater periods of time. Um, and, uh, and so if, if you look at portfolios that have an allocation to alternatives of anywhere maybe between 15 to 30% uh, or more, um, oftentimes the alternatives are going to help reduce risk while see greater levels of return. But of course, there's different things that uh, investors have to consider with respect to alternative investments. Sometimes they don't have as much liquidity. Uh, you know, there are alternative investments that are daily liquid. Uh, but then there's alternative investments that might have quarterly liquidity. And then other times they have maybe like a lockup provision. Um, hey Matt, what, what do you, when you think of the word liquidity, what is, what is that kind of, uh, yes, you, know, you. you know, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when I think of liquidity, what I think of is if I need my money tomorrow, can I get it? Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to stocks and bonds, if I sell today during market hours, Essentially, I have the ability to access my capital within one, within one to two days. With alternative investments, that's not always the case. Um, uh, and so that could potentially be a drawback, but certainly something to consider. Maybe it's actually not even a drawback because you're not going to be touching your capital for extended periods of time. But, but that's what I mean uh, by uh, having perhaps less liquidity than a traditional stock and bond investment. Um, the other consideration is uh, correlation of stocks and bonds, and I touched on this for a moment. Uh, I mean, this is the uh, certainly the benefit to them is uh, oftentimes that the idea is if we're able to uh, had have a sleeve or different alternatives in the portfolio, uh, it's not going to move in lockstep with the broader stock and bond market. Perhaps a drawback with, with some alternative investments is there could be a little bit less transparency, you know, with a stock or a, a bond, uh, whether you're owning an individual stock or bond or owning a, a mutual fund or an ETF, you have a pretty good idea of exactly what's exposed within these particular types of investments. Right. Like if I own Microsoft stock, I can easily go to, you know, Google and type in you know, the, the ticker symbol MSFT and find yeah. out what the price is, right? It's very transparent in some cases with some of these alternatives, uh, you know, um, there, there may be a slight lag in terms of, you know, uh, kind of reporting and you have to make sure you fully are comfortable and understand how performance is evaluated, right? Yeah, on top of that, and, and, and I think that brings us to the point is, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing a pretty significant amount of research on the alternatives that you might be considering adding to your portfolio. And the reason why that is, is because, you know, not all, I mean, like with any other investment, not all alternatives are created equal. Um, and so that kind of lastly takes us to like the risk return trade off. Of course, there's different uh, risk considerations at all. Uh, investors need to consider with with regard, with regard to alternatives, perhaps liquidity risk, uh, less transparency risk, manager risk, but then also that, that should be considered along with the positive trade-offs 
that the alternative investment that uh, could ultimately provide to the portfolio, including less risk and, and enhanced returns. I and know. So Go ahead. Sorry, and I think in terms of the risk return trade off, Matt, and you've probably heard this before as well. We we really try to seek equity like returns with fixed income or bond type of risk, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. a hard, it's a hard inflection point to to hit on, but when you find that, um, you know that's really where alternatives can add a lot of value to the to the portfolio. Absolutely. So let's talk about uh, different specific. Uh, you know, sub asset classes within this broad alternative, uh, you know, uh, asset class category. So, of course, uh, real estate is a what we would consider a um, an alternative asset class. And oftentimes, you know, real estate will, of course, fall into the real assets uh, bucket of different types of uh, uh, alternative investments. Oftentimes, real estate is a, a great type of investment that helps uh uh, offset uh, the cost of inflation, right? And the 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 price or the value of the asset will keep up with uh, any any type of inflationary pressures. And then also, you know, real estate along with commodities. Uh, also, commodities can also fit into this real assets basket. Um, can help uh, reduce correlation to traditional stocks and bonds. And so that's something else to consider. One reason why people. Uh, like gold as a commodity uh, in a portfolio is because oftentimes gold can have an inverse relationship to the broader stock market. And so um, that's another type of a real asset that you can see in client portfolios. Another one is a hedge fund. You know, of course, uh, the the uh, hedge fund category is an incredibly broad category. Of course, we hear on the news or CNBC of these hedge funds taking significant amounts of risk. And there's certainly different types of hedge funds out there that do that. Uh, you know, when we seek to uh, utilize a, like a hedge fund allocation in our client portfolios, what we're looking for is actually more of a defensive manager that is not going to have a correlated return to, you know, your traditional stocks and bonds. Uh, at all. So if stocks and bonds are going down, you know, your hedge fund allocation uh, is either pr perhaps flat, slightly negative, or maybe even up on the year. And uh, that's the whole point of having a, a hedge fund in the portfolio. And, and then lastly, or excuse me, not lastly, but uh, private equity is uh, another allocation. And very similar to hedge funds, you know, private, uh, private equity is an incredibly large asset class, right? You can have like venture capital, uh, or a growth equity that uh, certainly uh, typically be uh, is oftentimes more risky than a more pre-IPO or even a diversified private equity allocation. And, and the idea of, of private equity, granted, of course, this is going to be more considered of a growth or a risk asset in the portfolio. But the idea is over the course of time, you're able to enhance returns with a private equity allocation. And then, and then lastly, you know, I think one thing that all these different types of alternative investments have in common is they're seeking to help reduce risk in the portfolio by just broader diversification. Cool. Let's talk about risk tolerance. You know, risk tolerance is, you know, one thing that, you know, in my conversations with my clients, I think that it's probably one of uh our biggest responsibilities as advisors is to truly understand our uh, our clients' risk tolerance. But then at the same time, what we also have to understand is risk capacity. And so we'll talk about those two different things real quick. Risk capacity, and I alluded to this earlier, is you know aside of tolerance, aside from your stomach for risk, risk capacity is how much am I able, how much risk am I able to take on given my my time frame. Uh, and and ultimately my goal as well. And so of course, the longer the time frame, uh, the greater the uh, arguably the greater risk capacity. However, what changes all of that is if an investor does not have the tolerance or the stomach for risk. The last thing that you want as an investor is to be in a very aggressive portfolio where you're seeking the greatest level of return because you're perhaps in an, an allocation of 100% growth assets like equities. But when markets get ugly and they always get ugly is to completely pull the plug and, and go to cash. And that's when risk tolerance becomes so important because the idea is when markets do get ugly, we want to, to the best of our ability, stay the course 
because when you build a portfolio, when we build a portfolio for our clients, the idea is you want to build the portfolio for uh, a lot of different outcomes, but particularly those the market outcomes that are not so great in shorter periods. And that's why we we tend to look at risk tolerance as not just an individual or family's ability to take risk, because a, a lot of us are, are able and, and willing to, uh, or excuse me, able to take risk in, in the markets. We have a long horizon. Uh, we don't need to access our portfolios for years or sometimes even decades. But the other side of risk tolerance is the willingness to take risk. So it's ability and willingness. If you're not willing to ride the ups and downs of the market and perhaps at a really significant downturn might be tempted to go, you know what, I can't stomach this, time to go to cash and get out of the market, then you know we need to have a conversation around how to adjust the mix of stocks and bonds and alternatives in the portfolio to meet your true risk tolerance. So I always like to consider the two dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, you know, uh, the next uh, the next piece that we we're hoping to just share with you is, you know, how we as advisors uh, consider, you know, risk preferences. And oftentimes as a starting point, we have our, our clients complete a risk tolerance questionnaire. Uh, this risk, to risk tolerance qu questionnaire is very basic in nature, but gives us a an idea of many different data points that we consider when understanding a client's uh, risk preferences, ultimately what tells us uh, the, the proper risk profile of a particular client portfolio or particular uh, sum of money is based off of just a conversation and having a real conversation about, you know, if, if things get ugly, uh, what do you what 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 do you tend to do and, and how do you overcome that? And how can we help you as your advisor make sure that when things get ugly, uh, we don't pull the plug on the investment plan that we put in place. I'll we'll say one more thing, and then it looks like McKenna, we might have a question over here. Um, in terms of risk tolerance, Matt alluded to this already, but this risk tolerance survey is just one of many data points that we take into consideration when we're customizing a portfolio, right? There's, you know, uh, we want to take a look at a personal net worth statement, cash flow projections, have conversations as Matt alluded to as well, right? Actually get to know those who were building the portfolio for this risk assessment helps to start to give us an idea of where we're going to end out in terms of, um, you know, asset mix for the portfolio, but it's not the end all be all. Yeah. McKenna, do we have a question over there? Yeah, I just wanted to get a little bit more insight. Uh, since you guys both have extensive experience in the industry, what advice would you guys offer to college graduates seeking to kickstart their career in this field? Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would just say uh, get your your feet wet you know uh get as much experience as you as you possibly can uh intern as, as many places as you possibly can you know of course naturally it's great to intern at a particular company and then maybe start there as an employee once the internship is over but uh, another consideration is intern as at many places as you can so you can kind of get a good feel of um the, not just the company you, you work for but the uh the uh, type of work that you would be doing um, because you know within wealth management there's a lot of different uh, types of wealth management companies out there not all of them are created equal uh, and then the same thing just goes with finance uh, uh, at a more broad level whether it be financial services companies those who are seeking to support other financial services professionals and companies but then finance altogether with respect to you know, working for an alternative investment company, working as a, as a wholesaler, working at, um, uh, with respect to maybe helping companies raise capital, things of this particular nature. So uh, I would say explore, 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 and then ultimately, uh, you know, pick the one that uh, fits you the best. Yeah, Matt said it best is, yeah, try try a number of different things. My my advice is really just to piggyback off of that that comment, finance is so broad that you really won't know what you want to focus on until you really try things and see what fits both your skill set and your interest and piques your interest. So try a number of things. 
Uh, and I think the the greatest perk to what we do, if I could provide a plug to the wealth management space for a second, is that everything that we preach and instill and apply across the client portfolios and the financial plans that we work with, we're able to uh, instill and apply that to our own personal lives as well. And, you know, learn how to manage our own finances uh, better and better as time goes on. So uh, it's just kind of a personal life life hack, if you will, to this to this industry. Nice. And since you guys both have your CFP designation, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that process? I, I I'm happy to to start there, Matt. I think my my personal guidance on that on that front is to uh, you know try to try to get your CFP certification as soon as you can. If again that's the path that you choose to take, I found that I took a. I got my master's right after college and worked during the day and got my master's at night and then went right into my CFP studies at night while I worked during the day as well. And I'm very, it was very challenging time uh, uh, to work and study at the same time, but I'm very glad I did it before uh, I had a family, before, uh, you know, I had other obligations, responsibilities, et cetera. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased that I just kind of stuck with it all and didn't take too long of a break uh, after graduating from my undergrad coursework before I jumped into CFP and master's study because I've just found the further you get away from um, uh, education, the harder it is to to kind of go back. That would be my my guidance. Yeah, I would say I'd say the same exact thing. I um you know I I being in financial services since two thousand and eight. You know I've always I got really uh, accustomed to taking tests over and over again. And so while if you um, are used to taking tests and studying, uh, do it while you um, are used to it. Because um, I think that ultimately that will help you. And here's the thing is, you know, uh, I definitely think for, if you want to be an advisor in the, in the long run, getting your CFP is, of course, baseline. But here's the, the other thing is, you know, if you choose not to be an advisor later on, it, the uh, coursework and the experience will only serve you and your family and, uh, in the long run as well. So um, think about That's it that way as well. Fun fact, I think one of Matt's first days at Beacon Point, he had to announce to the entire company whether he passed or failed the CFP. And he, fortunately <laughs> for him, he, he had passed it first first try. So uh, I'll never forget that introduction to Matt Hen. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think with with that, you all will be in for um, a great overview from Larry Riddell from St. James here uh, next week. I know, uh, you know, Larry has actually been a guest speaker at uh, the UCI course that myself and several other colleagues here uh, Beacon Point teach. And uh, he is a very engaging speaker and will offer some good insights and just macroeconomically how, how they're looking at the world over at St. James. So I might even tune into that discussion as well as I always like to pick his brain on what's going on. So thank you all very, very much for your time. And uh, McKenna, unless you had anything else, I think that that does it for us. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, before we conclude, um, as a friendly reminder to keep in touch with us, we have a QR code, if you wouldn't mind going to the next page, Dylan. We have a QR code to make it easy. So all you have to do is open up your phone, click into your camera and scan the QR code until yeah. a link pops up that will take you to some of our great content, various Beacon Point social media pages and our Your Dollars Are Sense podcast hosted by two of our talented Beacon Point Wealth Advisors. That wraps up today's class on the economic basics of stocks, bonds, and alternative investments. We appreciate you joining us, and we will see you again next week when we release our fourth class session at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, on Friday, June 28th, investing in the role of a money manager with special guests from St. James Investment Company, Larry Riddell, as our class professor. Thanks all for tuning in. Thanks, everyone.